available. And um, the question is, is this something that's desirable or maybe not necessary? Great. Well, thanks for listening to my prophetic uh, computer science talk earlier. So we'll kind of go back into spine surgery here. Um, so as, as Jens mentioned, uh, couldn't, couldn't be more accurate. I, this is one of my biggest pet peeves as a surgeon, is seeing somebody with the, as he, even like we demonstrated last night, a mid-cervical trauma, and suddenly you look at an x-ray on them and they refuse to the occiput for reasons you just aren't even really sure why. Um, so just a quick discla disclaimer, you know, there's, there's definitely a time and a place for cervical occipital fusions. Um, but it's extremely important to avoid them when it's possible, and that's what we're going to focus on here. So upper cervical spine trauma, just um, as a whole, it, it definitely has some unique challenges within spine trauma that other segments of the spine uh, do not have. These are highly mobile segments, and these are small bones, so therefore you're going to have small hardware uh, to work with. And also you're, you're, you're limited in terms of your options for fixation in these levels. So as far as when to perform an occipital cervical spine fusion, as far as your traumatic indications are concerned, uh, obviously, atlanto-occipital dislocation. Um, we're going to listen to a talk by Ashraf at, at the end of today um, about, you know, are we possibly over-treating this? Um, but really, this is pretty rare. Uh, you don't see this too often, even in a level one or level two uh, trauma center. Um, C1 burst fractures with completely destroyed lateral mass, masses and nothing to fixate, fixate to, particularly when the uh, posterior ring is destroyed. Uh, that would be an indication to consider going to the occiput. Um, or if you're dealing with a severely unstable translational rotational injury of C1, C2, or again, you're just limited in terms of, uh, of your uh, points of fixation. Uh, what's not an indication for going up to the up to the occiput is going to be isolated atlanto-axial instability and semi or fully intact bone structures. That really you need to try and stay away from the occiput. Um, not to mention occipital spinal or occipital cervical fusions are, are in them within and of themselves fairly challenging. Um, they can be technically difficult. Positioning is a major issue, and we'll we'll touch on that. Um, getting a solid arthrodesis um, across the uh, a or across the C0, C1 joint um, is, is a problem. Um, and that results in a lot of hardware failure. And you've got to pay very uh, close attention to the occipital anatomy uh, with your preoperative CAT scans. Um, uh, in particular, the anatomy of the, of the keel as well as where the sinuses are. So why are these why are these fusions so morbid? And what are some of the complications that we see with them? Well, obviously, if you're fusing someone's, the base of their skull to their neck, uh, there's going to be some, some heavy biomechanical considerations um, uh, that you have to take into account. You're going to lose about 30% of your flexion extension after an occipital cervical fusion, and about 10 degrees of lateral rotation and bending, um, and more than that if you go below C2. And, and positioning is so key for these patients before, um, before you start your surgery, um, particularly in the, the older population. If you have a 85-year-old patient that, God forbid, or 90-year-old that you have to do um, an, occipital, an occipital fusion on and you, you overextend them um, in your positioning, those patients are going to be, number one, they're going to be extremely unhappy, but number two, that's a potentially very dangerous situation for those older folks because they need to be able to look at the ground and see where their feet are walking. Going upstairs for them um, may be something that they can't do anymore um, if you fuse them hyperextended. Uh, so please, please keep that in mind. Uh, physiologically, about 20% percent of, of patients after undergoing these surgeries have some uh, degree of dysphagia, particularly if you um, uh, militarize the patient, hyperflex uh, the patient. Uh, a lot of these patients will have dysphagia after surgery. Um, also, a lot of them will develop uh, dyspnea uh, because they uh, uh, collapse their trachea a little bit, as well as obstructive sleep apnea, um, very avoidable complications. Uh, technically speaking, again, I already touched on this a little bit, but screw loosening is uh, much more common uh, with uh, extending your fusion of the occiput rather than staying in the uh, cervical spine. And this could require, uh, obviously, hardware revision. 
plus or minus halo mobilization as well, and that's seen in, in as many as uh, seven percent of some of these some of these cases. Um, and the rate of pseudarthrosis is much higher uh, than the rates seen in uh, C12 alone. Um, so recognizing when or when not to go to the occiput and, di and, and formulating a proper diagnosis is key. Because again, the occiput can be avoided in the, in the majority of high cervical traumas, especially if, you're, if your pathology is centered at C1, C2. Limit your construct. One thing that I, I've always said to my residents and fellows um, uh, with regard to the lumbosacral spine is the pelvis is your friend, okay? The pelvis, you're not going to lose any... Uh, you're not going to lose any motion segments by extending your construct to the pelvis and getting an extra anchor at the very bottom of your construct. Um, the, at, whereas the craniocervical junction and the occiput, the occiput is not your friend, okay? You only use that and you only use that as a strong anchor if you have to, um, if you're worried about atlanto-occipital uh, instability. Um, so don't use it as a, as a, as a crutch. Use it only for out of necessity. So kind of in summary here, um, when to go or when to consider going to the occiput, C12 instability with bony destruction and or atlanto, <clears throat> uh, uh, sorry, that's a, that's a typo, not atlanto-axial dislocation, but atlanto-occipital disassociation, when you would want to consider going to the occiput. Everything else really focused on stabilizing at C1, C2. So technically speaking, how, how, do you, how are you going to do this? How are you going to maximize the strength of your construct without going to the occiput? Well, whenever I'm doing my C1 to C2 constructs, I always try to achieve uh, bicortical screws. Um, if, you're if you're looking to achieve even further strength, uh, particularly your C1 screws, you can do palm screws, and that's posterior arch lateral mass screws as, as depicted by that yellow line. Um, so we're looking at a sagittal view of the, of the C, C1 anatomy. Um, so you can actually start your entry point within the posterior arch and have it go through uh, the anterior aspect of the C1 lateral mass like you normally would um, with a traditional trajectory as seen in red. Um, here's a, a C2 pedicle screw. Uh, typically, if you, if you aren't shy about putting large C2 pedicle screws in, those, those will usually be about a length of 26, 28 millimeters. And again, I always try to achieve um, bicortical fixation with those. Um, we talked last night about a C1 ORIF case. Um, if the rule of spence is violated, there, or if you have, and or if you have floating C1 lateral masses, um, you can always use uh, cross links across C1. That's a very, very valuable uh, technique and tool um, in those types of cases. And again, if, if, you're, if you're doing a C1, C2 fu fusion, make sure you get a solid decortication of that joint um, and use of viable bone graft in that area. So uh, a case example that um, I, I did relatively recently, this was last year. Um, so we had a 70-year-old female who had a fall from stairs while she was intoxicated. I think that's the second case we've had uh, like that today. But uh, presented to our ER, and her only complaint, thankfully, was severe neck pain. She did not um, have any neurologic deficit. And she had a remote history in the past of a C4 to 7 uh, ACDF. So here are her. Uh, uh, preoperative CT images. So as you can see, she's got a posteriorly displaced type 2 dense fracture um, and an uh, enlarged uh, atlanodental interval. Um, on, the, on some of the parasagittal images, uh, the, the first image that's titled left here, you can see that that C1 lateral mass is encroaching into the uh, vertebral foramen of C2. So that was something um, that we heavily considered there. Um, and that the posterior arch of C1 is, is fractured, um, again, on that, on that parasagittal view. Um, and on the right side, the anatomy uh, looked relatively intact. Um, the, and as you can see also on these images, the occipital C1 joint um, did not uh, appear like there was any, it did not appear like there was any sort of violation there. Um, on the coronal view, because most of the fractures occurred on her left side um, with regard to C1, um, it, she did start to tilt off to her left side a little bit. This is what the axial view looked like. Again, she had that um, posteriorly dislocated C2 that you can see on MRI, but also on the, on the axial of C1, uh, the, the left lateral mass is more or less floating because there is a, um, there is a 
clear disruption, in my opinion, of the TAL. Um, and also, there is a um, uh, this fracture that's oriented um, across the lateral mass, but it also encompasses the anterior arch and the posterior arch of C1. Um, and thankfully, again, her, her cord uh, was not compromised in any way. I was very worried about that left vertebral artery, so I did have uh, one of our neurovascular colleagues do a preoperative angiogram on her, and what we saw there was there was retrograde flow um, through her <clears throat> left vertebral artery, um, so that was not a viable artery anymore. Um, so we're dealing with some fairly complex anatomy uh, with a singular functioning vertebral artery, so this is definitely one of those high-risk uh, types of cases that requires a lot of focus while you're in the OR. Um, so for this case, 70 years old, she's, she's you know, despite being intoxicated and, and being a fairly heavy, heavy drinker, she is a very active person, still works. Um, so I really wanted to try and avoid extending a fusion to the occiput in her case. Um, my biggest concern for that was how stable is C1, C2, um, is, is C1 going to be in terms of my uh, fixation? Uh, considering there was a likely disruption of the TAL, uh, but also there was a rotational component um, to this injury, as well as you can see on the on the axial film. So, when I placed these C1, C2, or sorry, these C1 screws uh, with her, uh, there, there wasn't an opportunity to do palm screws because the posterior arch was um, uh, extremely mobile due to the fracture. So, um, I put in traditional C1 lateral mass screws. I did this under fluoro. I get very nervous about using navigation and robotics when I'm dealing with a fracture that's, that's this unstable. Um, and I mean, you, you barely touch it. You, you put your Pinfield 4 on it to, to get your landmarks in surgery and things are flopping around. So um, navigation to me is just not reliable enough and not safe enough in my hands. Um, but we placed uh, bicortical C1 lateral mass screws. And uh, again, I used that cross link across C1 um, uh, to provide provide that um, uh, lateral uh, rigidity to this uh, construct. So for her, uh, given the fact that she did have that prior uh, C4 to 7 ACDF, we ultimately decided to do a posterior C1 to 5 fusion um, with a C1 head to head uh, cross link. Um, I usually, as I mentioned, I try to go bicortical and on my C2 screws, 26, 28 millimeters, somewhere in there, with, a, with only one functioning vertebral artery. Um, I was I was not uh, very aggressive with my with my C2 um, screws, particularly when doing this case with with one of our residents. So um, I, I figured that we would have some some leeway in in the inferior strength of the construct since we had to go down to about C5 to to span that old ACDF. So this patient did very well. Um, six months after surgery, she had minimal neck pain. Um, she was at her neurologic baseline and and, and really really happy and pleased with the result that she got. So in summary, um, occipital, occipital cervical fusions are, are very morbid procedures. So uh, please don't, don't use it um, as a crutch. Uh, use it, again, when you have to, because it significantly alters patients' biomechanics as well as their physiology with things like swallowing and breathing. Um, recognize that you can limit your construct to C1-2 using a lot of the technical pearls that, that we discussed, but but bear in mind, you know, there still is a time and a place for, for occipital cervical fusions, just, just only when necessary. So, thank you. So, technical question. I really liked your topic and that uh, the thoughts and the um, technique shown there for those cases. Really well done and so important. Couldn't agree more. Technical point. So, if you have a floating lateral mass, like in the case shown last night, any technical point is of how to actually drill into that? This is not exactly sitting locked in there, this is kind of free floating. Yeah. So how do you get a safe trajectory going so that you can actually manipulate this without tearing the vertebral artery or dislodging it? Yeah, so I actually rely very heavily on freehand technique when, when I'm doing cases like this. Um, as I said, navigation is not going to be um, accurate enough, in my opinion, in these cases when you've got lateral masses that are floating around with just the slightest touch of a Pinfield 4. So kind of getting back to the basics, 
um, inserting instrumentation under direct visualization. I will have my assistant hold a pin field four on the medial aspect of the C1 lateral mass or on the medial aspect of the C2 pedicle while I'm putting this in. I'll use, I'll use um, uh, fluoro to, to guide me, but I don't rely on it as heavily as I do under direct visualization. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is I'll, I'll use a, a hand power drill. Um, and I'll, I'll let the drill do, it work, do the work for you. One of the things that Yen's always taught to us as fellows is um, uh, high speed. Slow advance. Yeah, high speed, slow advance. Um, and let the drill do your work for you so that you're not pushing down on the lateral mass and causing a lot of unnecessary motion. Great. Any other questions, comments? Otherwise, let's use the momentum and the uh, gain time. Thank you, Ryan.